Our second scripture reading for this morning comes from 1 Kings chapter 17, verses 8 through 24. That's on page 299 of your pew Bible. 1 Kings 17, 8 through 24. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah. Arise, go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow there to feed you. So he arose and went to Zarephath. And when he came to the gate of the city, behold, a widow was there gathering sticks. And he called to her and said, bring me a little water in a vessel that I may drink. And as she was going to bring it, he called to her and said, bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. And she said, as the Lord your God lives, I have nothing baked, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little oil in a jug. And now I am gathering a couple of sticks that I may go in and prepare it for myself and my son that we may eat it and die. And Elijah said to her, do not fear, go and do as you have said, but first make me a little cake of it and bring it to me sorry, and bring it to me, and afterward make something for yourself and your son. For thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, the jar of flour shall not be spent, and the jug of oil shall not be empty until the day that the Lord sends rain upon the earth. And she went and did as Elijah said, and she and her, he and her household ate for many days. The jar of flour was not spent, neither did the jug of oil become empty, according to the word of the Lord that he spoke by Elijah. After this, the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, became ill, and his illness was so severe that there was no breath left in him. And she said to Elijah, what have you against me, O man of God? You have come to me to bring my sin to remembrance and to cause the death of my son. And he said to her, give me your son. And he took him from her arms and carried him up into the upper chamber where he lodged and laid him on his own bed. And he cried to the Lord, O Lord my God, have you brought calamity even upon the widow with whom I sojourn by killing her son? Then he stretched himself upon the child three times and called to the Lord, O oh Lord my God, let this child's life come into him again. And the Lord listened to the voice of Elijah, and the life of the child came into him again, and he revived. And Elijah took the child and brought him down from the upper chamber into the house and delivered him to his mother. And Elijah said, See, your son lives. And the woman said to Elijah, now I know that you are a man of God and that the word of the Lord in your mouth is truth. This is the word of the Lord. I just wanted to make it clear that Anne LaPlante and Fernando are not visiting Pastor Andrew when he is in prison. In case you were wondering. That was a joke, really, to joke. He's, he's not on a pass for the weekend. If your Bible's turned to 1 Kings 17, we continue our study of the book of Elijah. Elijah is living in a nation that was supposed to be God's nation supposed to be living out the reality of God, showing themselves, but also the surrounding nations, who God is like, what, and what does he do? But now the northern kingdom of Israel is being ruled by King Ahab and Queen Jezebel, who are actually funding from the treasury the false worship of Baal and Asherah. The nation is compromised spiritually. 
Last week we saw that Elijah began to pray Deuteronomy 11 over the nation of Israel, praying that God would fulfill his promises when God's people got off track. God would withhold rain and God begins to answer that request. But of course, as uh, God is providing for Elijah with the ravens bringing him food morning and evening as he's by the brook Cherith, drinking the water, as God begins to answer Elijah's prayers that were based on God's word, now the brook runs dry and now Elijah begins to suffer. And now what we just read is that God directs Elijah to move to a new locale. To move from the brook Cherith, which was probably east of the Jordan River, and to go, frankly, way up north to Zarephath. In fact, what makes it odd is that Zarephath was outside Israel. It was in Sidon, which, if you remember was the home of Jezebel. I'm sure this did not make a lot of sense to Elijah when he was directed. I don't think the raven feeding program and the brook Cherith as it begins to dry up made a lot of sense to Elijah. But he obeys. He obeys God. And so now Elijah shows up in Zarephath, in Sidon, the, the, the country uh, where Jezebel is from, and then equally probably perplexing to Elijah, he, he's directed to a widow who will supply his needs, but she basically looks like she's got one meal left for her son and herself. And I'll be honest with you, I remember reading this story as a young boy you know, I was in Sunday school, and I thought it was really a cool story that God provided. Um, I didn't know how provocative this story actually was. Till much later, as a follower of Jesus. Because what God is doing here is somewhat profound. Yes, there's a miracle. Yes, there's going to be oil and, and, and water and bread and food for, for Elijah and, and the widow and her son. And there's a, a coming back to life of the, the widow, was son. I mean, it's a tremendous miracle. But God is illustrating who he is and what he does in a profound way. In a very real sense, we need to learn what God was teaching Elijah about himself. We need to come to grips with who the God of Elijah is, what he does, how he operates. And when we do, we will... I think, respond differently to those around us. And so, let's uh, take a look at two realities of who God is as revealed to us in this story, but then in each of the, 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 the truths about who God is, I, I think it will motivate us to uh, live very differently, live consistently with who God actually is and what he actually does. The first truth that we see vividly uh, displayed here is that God, God, the true God, is a God who works with marginalized people. You could say it another way. God is a God who works with, with, with weak people. He works with the marginalized. He works with the powerless. Again, notice what God commands Elijah to do in verse 8. He says, Then the word of the Lord came to him, Arise, go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow there to feed you. This widow is not a power broker in Sidon. She's poor. I don't think we understand that. When you were a widow in first century, in, well, this isn't even first century, going back, going back 700, 800 years before the time of Christ, a widow would have, because she lost her husband and now loses her son, her social security, her bank account, her, her, her way to be provided for has all been destroyed. She's marginalized, clearly unable really to support herself. She's down to her last meal. 
She has a son, which further erodes the widow's ability to support her family. This is a very unlikely place to send a prophet of God. It's sort of amazing that, 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 that Elijah himself obeys God, strange as this request would have sounded to his ears. But it shows us what kind of a God we have. A God who cares for the marginalized, a God who cares for the poor, a God who cares for someone who's needy, a God who cares for those who are weak. What this demonstrates to us is that the true God, the God of the Bible, is a God of grace. He's not a God who, who, who basically says, if you can really perform well, then I will bless you. He's a God who goes to those who are powerless, who can't make themselves right with him and, and blesses undeserving people who have not worked or earned God's favor, he freely gives it as a God of grace. And I think that's hard for us sometimes to remember. God is not about working with the strong primarily, but that's what we like to do, right? I mean, you want to surround yourself with friends, maybe you have some access to power. People who can get you to where you need to go. You need to network, as they would say. Grace is always about blessing an undeserving person, a person who can't get there on their own. Grace is not rewarding the strong, but blessing the weak. This is the upside down nature of who the true God is. Our God is really not a God of religion. Religion is all about working really hard and earning something. The God of grace is giving something to undeserving people. Now we read in our New Testament passage why this was so shocking. I'm going to remind you of what we read just a few minutes ago. Turn to Luke chapter 4. Jesus comes into the synagogue, reads a portion of Isaiah in verse 18. And this is what Jesus read to the synagogue. He said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me. And what has he anointed Jesus for? To proclaim good news to the poor. There we have this God of grace. This God that, 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 that is moved to work with the powerless, the weak, the marginalized, to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives, recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. There you have it. Jesus uh, acknowledging that he is the fulfillment of this passage, which he will say that this passage has been fulfilled in your hearing. He says that in verse 21, today the scripture has been fulfilled. And they all spoke well, well of him. They marveled at the gracious words that were coming from his mouth. And yet they said, is this not Joseph's son? Jesus quotes to them the proverb, physician, heal yourself. What we have heard you did at Capernaum, do here in your hometown as well. And he said, truly I say to you, no prophet is acceptable in his hometown. And then this is where he creates problems. Jesus says, but in truth, I tell you, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah, when the heavens were shut up three years and six months, and a great famine came over all the land, and Elijah was sent to none of them, but only to Zarephath in the land of Sidon, to a woman who was a widow. He goes on to talk about in the days of Elisha, the prophet that would come after Elijah. There were lots of lepers, apparently, but only Naaman the Syrian was healed. And when they heard these things, all in the synagogue were filled with wrath. They rose up. They drove him to a hill. They were going to throw him off this hill. Throw him off the cliff is what they were going to do. But passing through their midst, he went away. You have to see this to understand how offensive and strange God's commands to Elijah were. He's the prophet of God. The nation's in chaos. Yes, he goes and talks to King Ahab in 1 Kings 17.1. But then he's directed to go to Sidon, the land of Jezebel, to the pagans, to the Gentiles, to the idolaters, to a widow, and do ministry there. 
And when Jesus reminds the people of this story from the Old Testament, they want to kill him. Because you see, in the first century, the average Jewish person had a religious view of God. God was someone who had blessed the good people. And if you obeyed enough and, 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 and followed God's law enough, then God would bless you. But, but, but Elijah shows us that God is not a God of religion. He's a God of grace. He goes to the undeserving. He goes to the weak, the powerless, those that can't in their own strength muster up enough righteousness. That's the person that God is drawn to. The weak, the poor, the marginalized. This is what the first century uh, uh, Israel was frustrated with Jesus all the time. He hung out with prostitutes. He hung out with tax collectors. He hung out with sinners. He was always healing. He had a group of women following him. None of this fit the religious view of God. Because God is a God of grace. A God who works with the outsider. A God who works with the poor, the imprisoned, those in society that are marginalized. That is who God is drawn to. Why? Because he's a God of grace. I think it's interesting that um, Jesus says it's, it's harder for a rich man to enter the, the kingdom of God, harder than the, than the camel to go through the, the eye of the needle, this small space in the wall of a, of a city in first century uh, Palestine to go. The camel getting through there, it would be, it's, it's harder for a rich person. Why is that? And we know theologically that none of us can come to Jesus unless the Spirit of God opens our hearts and we see our sin and we see the Savior, yes. But on an earthly level, I think it's demonstrably true in the history of the church that the people who are most, at least on an earthly basis, open to hearing the message of the gospel were the people who had less materially, materially. They were less powerful. They were often marginalized. They lived in a world where the, uh, the earthly power structure had left them in the dust. There was nothing really in this life that they could cling to and hold on as an identity or as their security. And they found at an earthly level, at a human level, so to speak, the gospel was terribly appealing. Because God is a God of grace. God works with the outsider, the marginalized, the poor, the imprisoned. Yesterday, if you were here uh, at, uh, at a funeral service for um, Susan Alcantara, if you remember, Susan, her husband, Jose, would often come in a wheelchair. This is about a year ago, and, and for several years, they would come. And he usually came and sat about right, right over there. And if you saw them, they would often close down the atrium. They would sit and talk with a lot of people. We thought about throwing them out. But they just kept talking and visiting and sharing. In the retelling of her life and in the people in the, the, the funeral service that I got to talk to afterwards, every single person talked about how Susan, in her 80 years of life and over the last 50 years in Princeton, was constantly caring for people who were suffering, who were uh, marginalized in some way. There was a whole bunch of them at the funeral. It's interesting, and just hearing her story, she was born with, with cerebral palsy. Didn't stop her from going to college, she got a degree. But she had significant physical limitations. And because of her limitations, she learned what many of us struggle to learn, is that God cared for those with limitations. God cares for the marginalized. And so what she wanted to do with her life is she majored in physical therapy so that she could help people in the same way that she had been helped through the physical therapy that she had received. That's how she met her husband, Jose. Jose had a full body cast. He was at Merwick for four, four, and a, four and a half, five months. Susan was the physical therapist who helped him during the day. And as they got acquainted with each other, at the end of uh, the four or five months when Jose got his body cast off and was about to leave, 
the, the rehabilitation center there, he asked her and said, would you go out with me? They knew each other quite well. She said, maybe. <laughs> they eventually went out and got married. Susan Alcantara understood that God was a God of grace and mercy, that God worked with weakness, her weaknesses, which were significant. Not only she had cerebral palsy, but many other physical ailments, dystonia, many multiple broke bones because, we, because of her, the weakness in her bones, all caused by these early problems that she had to live with her whole life. And yet, she understood that God was a God who poured his life into those who were weak. And then she turned around and did the same thing. And so many people were touched and came because she understood that God was a God of grace and mercy who worked with those that often get overlooked. That's the kind of God that Elijah has to learn about. God gives him a very vivid illustration of this. And if we really believe in a God that we see here in 1 Kings 17, if we really believe in a God who works with the poor, the dispossessed, the, the weak, he's a God of grace, not a God of religion, who rewards people for their faithfulness, but a God who actually enters into our unfaithfulness and weakness and draws us to himself. Not only do we understand that about God, but that's the way we ought to act towards others. And I think for all of us, we heard a testimony this morning, prison ministry. This is exactly the kind of ministry to those that can often get overlooked and ignored. But for each of us, we probably should ask the question, are we looking out for the dispossessed, the people on the margins, the people that, are, that really can't advance our career, the people that are weak, the people that are marginalized, the people that are suffering and difficulty? Are we on the lookout for someone like that and then move into their life because that's what God would have us do. We have a Mind the Gap ministry that seeks to do that here in town. We've got the prison ministry, been doing that. It's a number of folks who, who are, are working in, our, in some of the assisted living centers around here. A, a group of people that can often get neglected. I suspect a number of you in middle school and high school, you will go to lunchroom tomorrow. And there, you know there are certain people who never get invited to the power tables, to the popular table. They often eat alone with, without a, a lot of interaction. If you're following the God who works with the outsider, maybe God would call you to, to eat lunch with someone who's eating by themselves. Oh, you'll have an opportunity here in the atrium in a minute. We're going to go in the atrium. You can see the introverted people who wish they were anywhere else but the atrium of this church. I'm sorry. For me, it's a dream come true. I'm an extrovert. But I see people come into the atrium. In fact, I was talking to someone this morning who said the first six months they came to this church, they came in right here for service and they made a beeline out the door because when they looked at the atrium, they said, that's dangerous. There are people, you'll see them. They're alone. They're not really interacting. If we believe and are following a God of grace, a God of the marginalized, a God, we're going to notice and be directed by God. And, and we'll all be directed in different ways. But we will be working with the outsiders, with the marginalized, the dispossessed, the hurting, the suffering, those who are struggling with physical ailments, we will be the hands and feet of this God who cares deeply for those people. That's the first thing that Elijah has to understand. The second is this. Go back to 1 Kings 17. And 
The second thing that, that Elijah's going to have to learn, and I, I'm not, I don't know that he learned this exactly, although he learned aspects of this. You almost have to have the New Testament to fully understand what Elijah is picturing here about God. We read it earlier, Elijah stays with the widow and her son for many days, and God graciously kept a jar of flour with enough flour each day to feed the woman, her son, and Elijah. God kept a jar of oil with enough oil every day so that the widow and her son and Elijah were kept alive during the famine. But then tragedy strikes. After the provision of oil and the provision of the bread and the cakes, we read in verse 17, after this, the son of the woman, the mistress of the house became ill and his illness was so severe that there was no breath left in him. And she said to Elijah, what have you against me, O man of God? You have come to me to bring my sin to remembrance and to cause the death of my son. I think some of us, we grew up in an individualistic culture. We said, what in the world? Why would this woman think that? Why God was going to kill her son because of her sin? We don't see the community and family relationships that are so much more, uh, really honestly, sacred in other cultures. But this is her concern. She believes that Elijah has come, this prophet of God from Israel, God's people, Yahweh, and he's come to remind her of her sin, and God is going to kill her son on account of her sin. It's interesting in, in verse 20, as Elijah responds to this, he says, He cried to the Lord, O oh Lord my God, have you brought calamity even upon the widow with whom I sojourned by killing her son? Even Elijah is not really arguing with God on whether it would be right to, to take the life of her son because of her sin. This is how they thought. They, they believed that God was sovereign. He had the right to do, uh, to punish us for all of our sin. But this is the call that Elijah is calling out and this woman is calling out. Did God, was God trying to take the life of her son because of her sin? Now, you're not going to get to the New, until you get to the New Testament, you may not see this connection. But the answer to that question as we look at the New Testament is no, God is not going to kill the, uh, the son for your sin, woman, widow of Zarephath. What is God going to do? God's going to allow his own son to die for your sin and mine. Now, I don't know how much Elijah saw this or, or even understood this, but it's clearly uh, Elijah is, is learning that this God is a God who will send his own son to die for our sin. This woman thinks he, her son is dying because of her sin. She knows she's a sinner. And God is saying to all of us, no, my own son will be sent to live the life you should have lived, to die the death you deserved, so that you can live in spite of your sin. It's also interesting uh, what Elijah does here. In verse 19, he says to the woman, give me your son. Looks like he's dead. And he took him from his arms and carried him up on the upper chamber where he lodged and laid him on his own bed. He cried to the Lord, O Lord my God, have you brought calamity even upon the widow with whom I sojourned by killing? Then he stretched himself upon the child three times and cried to the Lord, O Lord my God, let this child's life come into him again. And the Lord listens to the voice of Elijah and the life of the child came into him again. It's interesting, Elijah stretches his body over the body of this dead boy. It's almost as if what Elijah's almost saying is he makes contact with the boy and lies on him. It's almost as if Elijah's saying, I'm willing to die. Take the, the, the disease and put it to me, God. It's a picture, I think, of what we'll ultimately know in the future is the death of Christ. Take a look at John 21, and when you see the only other words where it talks about stretching your arms out is when Peter is told his arms will be stretched out, showing the kind of death he would die, crucifixion. 
What Elijah is doing, whether he understood it fully or not, is reenacting exactly what God will do for us. He will send his own son to die in our place as our substitute. And of course, what's interesting, as Elijah acts this out, as he prays for the life of this boy, as he lies on him, his whole body engaged with this young boy, crying out for his life. When the life of the child is revived, verse 23, and Elijah took the child and brought him down from the upper chamber into the house and delivered him to his mother. And Elijah said, see, your son lives. And the woman said to Elijah, now I know that you are a man of God and that the word of the Lord in your mouth is true. In seeing the power of this God who works with the weak, who works with the poor, this God who will uh, rescue this young boy. And again, the picture is of, of a God who sends his own son to die for our sins so that we could live. As Elijah reenacts that, that crucifixion, and then the resurrection of this boy takes place, again, picturing that future resurrection it is the, the source of our hope for our future resurrection, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's only then that this pagan, idolatrous, widow woman living inside, now she knows that the word of the Lord in your mouth is true. And I do think this pushes us to think very carefully. Yes, we need to share the word of God to people. The truth of the gospel, the resurrection, Jesus died. God sent his own son to die in your place. But we also have to be involved with people in miniature ways. Demonstrate the reality of the substitutionary death of Christ for other people in miniature so that they see the gospel in action. I suspect a number of the, these men and women that, that Anne LaPlante's working with women and, 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 and Fernando and, and Andrew are working within that prison are, are just so grateful for human companionship to come in, to say hello, to call them their name, to pray for them, to care for them. They're demonstrating, but that takes time, that takes effort. It's a long drive to get to the prison. That, that's laying down your life in miniature for someone else. All of the things that we do in order to buttress the claims that we make about Jesus Christ have to be backed up in miniature by little examples of the gospel. And how do you do that? By sacrificially laying down your time, your energy, your resources in all kinds of ways to help somebody who's on the margins. I'll give you one bizarre story in my life trying to think about this. When I was in seminary, I worked with juvenile offenders. These were juveniles who had been convicted by a court of law, and instead of going to the juvenile jail or the juvenile detention center, they went to this halfway house where we would attempt to rehabilitate them. There were 12 young men living in this, middle school to early high school, and what I was doing with this, with this work, I was uh, doing a, a weekly Bible study, and once a month, I took over for the house parents, Denise and I would come, and we would care for these, these guys over the weekend. And usually that went pretty well, but one weekend, these guys were out of control. They were a mess. They didn't do anything I asked them to do. It was basically, well, it was kind of like parenting, you know? Nobody's doing what you ask them to do. It was chaos. It, it was, I mean, we were about ready to have a complete anarchy. And stupid me, of course, this wasn't Denise, this was me, in a frustrating with these guys, I said, all right, the next guy who disobeys, I'm calling the sheriff, and all of you are going back to the detention center. Stupid thing to say. Why? Because calling the sheriff and having them to back to the detention was a massive move that maybe the um, backup person shouldn't be making that call. Second problem with it is when these guys figured out I wasn't going to make that call, we were going to have, I, I thought I might be, I thought I might be tied up in ropes and, 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 and these guys would, I didn't know what was going to happen, but it was not good. I prayed a lot. Lord, help me. I don't know what to do. My wife was helpful. She said that was a dumb thing to say. Very helpful. 
And I got it, a flash of insight. Of course, within 15 minutes, it was chaos in the house. They had all violated. I couldn't call the, the sheriff. That was not out of the question. So I said, listen, guys, you've kept disobeying the rules. You're all going to have to swim uh, a lap in the pool. Now, it was pretty cold. It was about 45 degrees outside. So I had them in their swimsuits and their towels. I had them out the pool. Now, I realized if I have them go swimming, uh, I think the Youth and Family Services of Dallas County is going to have a word with me. So I had these guys, they're all out shivering. I said to them, listen, you guys can swim because you guys have been out of control, but I'll tell you what, I'll swim in your place. Now these guys were street savvy, and so they thought I was trying to trick them. So they huddled up. I could hear them saying, I think he's joking. I think he's gonna call the sheriff. I mean, I... Finally, they decided, okay, you swim. So I dove in the pool. Swam, it was cold. Swam a lap, got out of the pool. Said, all right, guys, it's over. Come on in. They wouldn't come in. They thought it was a joke. They kept saying, oh, should we go in? I had to go out three times. It's over. I paid the penalty. It's over. It's done. And by a miracle, the rest of that weekend, I've never seen a more docile group of juvenile offenders in my life. They kept asking me, why did you do that? And I was able to tell them when I've been telling them what the Bible said. This is what Jesus did for us. Yes, you guys were out of control. I paid the penalty. You're free. It blew their minds. And in a little miniature way, I was able to demonstrate the gospel in a miniature way to back up the words of the gospel that I'd shared with these guys many times. And when you, understanding that God is a God of the marginalized, God is a God of the poor, God is a God of the weak, and you begin to, to reach out and in your own way sacrifice a little part of you as, as a, a demonstration in miniature of what Jesus did ultimately for you. you. You demonstrate the power of the substitutionary death of Christ. And you'll have, like this widow woman say, now I know that what comes out of your mouth, Elijah, is true. This is the God we serve. But it's also in understanding the God we serve, we find out how we ought to serve. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, help us to understand who you are. You're the God of the weak. You're the God of the marginalized. You're the God of the powerless. And when we understand you as the God of grace, we can reach out to others and demonstrate grace and love and care. And in miniature, we can demonstrate in real time what you ultimately did for us when you laid down your whole life for us. And so when we lay down a portion of our lives for others, when we stretch our, 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 our efforts for someone who is in deep trouble, deep anguish, deep need, we show the world a little picture of what you, God, did for us when you sent your own son to die in our place. Help us, Lord, I pray in Jesus' name.